Okay, good morning. We have been, let's see, this is the 19th, so yes, this we'll have today and one more class, uh, one more session of this class on interpreting the Bible, understanding the Bible properly, and then we will be uh, done for this quarter. And we finished up last Sunday talking about the various figures. Well, there we go. So today, I don't know, my animation's a little bit off there. We're looking at how can we recognize figurative language. I, I kind of debated which of these to do first, but <clears throat> I don't think it matters that much either way. Uh, you know, do you first want to know how to recognize figurative language and then look at the various figures of the Bible? Or vice versa. I don't, I don't guess it really matters too much either way. <clears throat> but we've looked at all the different uh, figures. I believe, if I remember correctly, there are about 19 of those. Uh, I gave you that list because there are so many, so hopefully you'll have that. And if, if you ever uh, want to go back over that, or <clears throat> like I said before, it's kind of in a format where I think you could uh, keep it in your Bible and it would be pretty convenient to have that handy. But now we're going to ask the question, of course, Having looked at the various figures, <clears throat> parable, fable, synecdoche, um, you know, prophecy, and so on and so forth, these, these figures of speech that are used, how do we know when language is figurative and when it's literal? <clears throat> there are times when there is language that may appear to be figurative, but it is literal. And then there are times when language would appear to be literal and it's figurative. So it, it is a good, a good look, a good thing to look at for us to ask the question, of, well, how do we know? How, how can we determine the difference? Uh, several things that we could go over here as far as how to do this, and I'm going to try to get through all of this lesson today. I really hope to do so because then that gives us all of next week on the last lesson that I want to cover before we finish this out. And we've really condensed this because y'all know I can't get through anything in one week. <laughs> Every time I have a lesson that I want to get through, I, I don't end up getting through it. But we've condensed it down to sort of the brass tacks, and hopefully this study's been helpful to you. Well, when the literal meaning involves an impossibility, then you know you must have figurative language. A couple of examples. Jeremiah 1, 17 and 18. Well, Jeremiah there is referred to as a city, as a pillar, as... A wall. Well, obviously, a human being is not literally any of those things. So that's figurative language. Psalm 18, 1 and 2. God there is referred to as a rock, a buckler, uh, a shield there, a buckler, a uh, fortress, so on and so forth. Well, God is a spiritual being. He's obviously not literally any of those things. That would be an impossibility. So you know you've got figurative language. Uh, two other examples here, Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Jesus' body, take, eat, this is my body. Take, eat, this is, or drink, here's this cup, drink ye all of it. This is my blood. Uh, you know, again, obviously literal, I mean, figurative language. Revelation 3, 16, talking about the church at Laodicea. Because you're not hot or cold, I will spew thee out, literally vomit you out. Well, again, here's a spiritual being. He's not literally going to. Uh, throw up or vomit out a congregation. Of course, and how would you even uh, spew out an entire congregation of people? So, you know, you obviously you're dealing with figurative language there. But <clears throat> let me hasten to say this. Be careful not to make this the only factor because sometimes people do that and they allow their own whims or what they can see and experience with their own senses to determine what is or is not possible. For example, um, some things that we label as impossible, well, they are possible. Jesus being both man and God. Well, somebody might look at that and say, that's obviously figurative language. Jesus was not literally man and God because, I mean, that would be an impossibility. Well, that's, it seems impossible to us. How can a person be 100% man and then 100% God at the same time? I don't know. I mean, there's just some things that, there's no person on this earth. I don't care if they say they can explain it. They can't. You cannot explain that in human terms that we can understand. But uh, I'm trying to remember the exact wording. Leroy Dedman used to say something that uh, sort of stuck with me. 
Um, just because I can't explain something doesn't, may, doesn't mean that it's not so, I believe was the way he put it. And that certainly is a true statement. I can't explain to you why when I get in my car and I turn that key, that thing starts up. And when I put it in gear and press the gas, it'll go. I mean, it's a, a vehicle that weighs probably over, even my little Toyota Corolla probably weighs well over a thousand pounds, and yet with a little touch of the gas pedal, it'll, it'll take off. I can't explain that, but I know it works. And, you know, it doesn't mean I don't believe it. And there are people that can explain the why, why how, and wherefores of it, but I can't. Uh, same thing with a lot of computer stuff, you know, all these different things you can do with a computer. may not be able to explain it, but it doesn't change the fact that it's so. So, you know, Jesus being 100% God, 100% man, I can't explain it. I don't think any human being on earth can explain that <clears throat> satisfactorily in human terms, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. So be careful with this one, and that's why we give this little caveat here. Uh, the water of baptism. People have gotten hung up on that for years. How can physical water wash away spiritual sins? It is an impossibility, therefore baptism must not, cannot be necessary for a person's salvation. Well, I can't explain it. I do know that it's not the water that's washing away sins. Sometimes people will say, well, I don't see any sins floating in the baptistry. Well, of course you don't. Number one, you don't see sin. It's spiritual. Uh, number two, it's, it's not the physical water that's doing something. I'm obeying God in being baptized and immersed in the physical water itself. But I'm contacting through that act of obedience the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what washes away our sins, Revelation 1.5. But again, to man, that might seem to be an impossibility. And yet, 1 Peter 3.21 says, The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. So, you know, we, we got to be careful with this one. These are, these are just a couple examples of things that are impossible to many, but the Bible says they are definitely real. In fact, uh, Brother Tomlin was just reading a moment ago from 1 John, and this idea of uh, Jesus being man and God, uh, Gnosticism, you know, says that, or said, I don't, I don't know if there's still any Gnostics around, but they basically said all matter is evil, and so God can't fellowship with that which is evil, sinful. So there's no way that Jesus dwelt in a human body because that would have had him intimately intertwined with sin. And what the assumption is that, that makes the whole thing go off from the very get-go, the assumption is that all matter is evil. Matter is not evil or righteous. Matter is just matter. You know, the atomic bomb, is it bad? Well, it's, it's neither bad nor good. And that's what we do with it. Now, that's, that's been the case for all time with matter. You know, you take a knife, is it bad, is it good? Well, it's neither. But if you take that knife and stab somebody with it and take their life, then you've committed a, a sinful act. But if you take that same knife and use it, a very, very sharp knife, maybe perhaps use it for surgery, such as with a scalpel, and save somebody's life, well, then it's become a you know, very good tool and you've done something good. So you get the idea. Uh, matter, you know, that, that debate's going on right now with guns. You know, sometimes people say inherently guns are bad. We've got to get rid of all guns. Well, it's what do you do with it that determines. So be careful when we label something as impossible that it truly is. So this is a, this is a good criteria to look at but use it with other, uh, with other criteria also. So when the literal meaning involves an impossibility, but again, use that with other things. When the... Okay, I forgot to change my heading there. That's supposed to say... No, 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 I'm sorry. When the literal meaning causes a contradiction. I was, I was thinking when literal meaning from the last slide... So when the literal meaning involves an impossibility or causes a contradiction. The Bible doesn't contradict, of course, and so any interpretation which causes a contradiction, I know I'm wrong because the Bible doesn't contradict. And so if I've got something that puts the Bible, two passages against one another, then I'm missing it somewhere along the way. Death is an example. Hebrews 9.27. What's Hebrews 9.27 say? Somebody from memory. We, we know that short verse. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. <clears throat> Somebody read John 11, 25 and 26. You got it, Gary?
All right? Though he were dead, yet shall he live. Here's somebody that will never die. But didn't Hebrews 9.27 just say it's appointed unto men once to die? Well, Jesus in John 11 clearly is speaking figurative language. He means you'll live again after death. And, of course, death, you know, you study it more in Scripture, you learn is separation, separation of body and spirit. The spirit lives on. But you understand he's speaking figuratively in John 11, 25 and 26. After death, your soul will live on. Well, you'll live forever in heaven with God. Figurative language there. But if you take that literally, then you've got a contradiction because Jesus says, oh, you believe in me, you'll never die. So should I go around and tell, start telling people, if you become a Christian, you will never die. Christians don't ever die. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You, you just see everyday life. Christians die physically every day. And we, we see that happen. It happens to... Christians, it happens to non-Christians. Obviously, Jesus is talking figuratively. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 5. Somebody get that one, and then somebody else, if you would. Uh, Alan, I saw you got yours there. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, please. And then let me get maybe Brother Martin, if you don't mind, Ephesians 3, 8. Who's got 2 Corinthians 11, 5? Somebody's got it, I know. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, if you would, Brother David, go ahead and read uh, chapter 12, verse 11 while you're there. Very similar wording. <coughs> Paul says this twice right there in that context. All right, Paul says to those brethren, and we talked about this Wednesday, you know, you've compelled me to this comparison of credentials, so to speak. He said, I, I'm, I didn't want to, to do this, but you've compelled me. He says, I ought to be, you know, I ought to be getting letters of recommendation from you Corinthians. You, you all ought to be uh, my number one fans because I've done so much for you. He's not trying to toot his own horn. He's just trying to say, look, of all people who ought to be defending my apostleship, it ought to be you all, but they weren't. Uh, many of them there were attacking his apostleship. But he, he says, I am not one whit behind the very chiefest apostle. Now, uh, Alan, did you have 1 Corinthians 15 now? Why am the least of the apostles? I am not worthy to be called an apostle. Well, now hold on. Didn't he just say he was not one whit behind the very chiefest apostles? And now he says, I'm the least of the apostles? And he sounds like he's very bottom of the totem pole, doesn't it? Now Ephesians 3 8, who had that one? Well, great day. Now he says he's not even as much as the very least of the saints. He's less than the least of all saints. So which is it, Paul? You know, that's the skeptics' reasoning. You know, they, they think it's real cute. They have their, if you ever go online, if you want to get really angry and get your blood pressure up, if you ever have low blood pressure problems, you can go read this website called the Skeptics Annotated Bible. And they make the most ridiculous accusations against the Bible. Now, granted, there are some tough passages uh, to reconcile. Well, most of the time, it's because of an error in translation or an error in uh, a manuscript or copyist error or something like that. And we talked about that and we looked at how we got the Bible. But some of these are just like this. They'll make a note on 2 Corinthians 11 and 5 and say, oh, oh, Ephesians, um, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul says he's not even, he, he's the least of the apostles. Oh, oh, over in Ephesians 3, 8, he says he's not even as much, as high up in rank as the least of the saints, the Christians. Answer to all that, of course, is just what we're talking about. He's speaking figuratively. He says authoritatively, as far as the authority that Christ has given me, Paul says, I'm not one whit behind the very chiefest apostles. It's not like you sit there and you get a command and go, well, uh, you know, we, we did receive this from, a, from an apostle, but, uh, you know, we better check with Peter because he's a little bit higher on the totem pole and Peter trumps Paul. It doesn't work that way. Paul says we are all authoritative because it's not us 
who is speaking. We're not the ones who are speaking. It is Christ speaking through us. <clears throat> then in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and Ephesians 3, 8, he remembers the fact that he persecuted the church and he feels unworthy. But if you interpret both passages literally, you've got a contradiction. But that's obviously not what he's doing. He's just saying, I feel personally like I'm not even fit to be an apostle. I'm lower than, than the least of all saints. And yet this grace is given to me that I can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's his humility. Whereas in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, <clears throat> those verses there, he's talking about his authority as an apostle. <clears throat> Again, if the Bible contradicts, can't be the word of God. But <clears throat> when you understand the difference in literal and figurative language, many of these so-called contradictions just evaporate. They're gone. <clears throat> so that's uh, another way to recognize figurative language. Another way, number three here, is when, li when the literal meaning would demand something that is wrong or forbid something that is right. <clears throat> A lot of people take figurative passages to extremes that were never intended by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 18, 8 and 9. If your right hand offends you, Jesus says what? Cut it off. Cast it from thee. Better to enter into heaven maimed, enter into eternal life maimed, than to go into hell with your full body intact. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Well, you know, as a person sitting here <clears throat> one day and he, he's, uh, he's tempted to do things that are wrong, he says, well, I know the solution. I just need to cut off my right hand. Um, you know, maybe here's a person who's tempted to look at things that he shouldn't look at. You know, we have, we covered this in a sermon not too long ago, the problem of pornography in our society. Well, you know, should a person who has a problem with that just say, yeah, that's it, I'm, I'm plucking out my eyes. That's not the point, obviously. Jesus doesn't want us, you can learn from a lot of other passages of Scripture, putting them all together, God doesn't want anybody to mangle their body. Uh, you know, that, I don't know if it's still popular or whatnot, but at one time it became popular sometimes among young folks to cut themselves. I don't really understand, still is, uh, uh, but I don't understand what, I don't, I don't know what, there are different reasons for that, I suppose, but you know, that's something that God has not ever wanted us willingly hurting our bodies, doing things that will harm our bodies. So, when he says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off, what he's saying is, we've often used the phrase, whatever it takes to go to heaven. Whatever it takes. And, you know, I, I've, we talked about it with the sermon on pornography. You know, if your internet offends you, cut it off. If the extra channels on the television offend you, have them taken out. You know, sometimes I, I've, I've talked to people that act like, I just got to have all those channels on my cable. No, you don't. You can go without cable. You can go without television, period, if that's what it takes. And, you know, you think about it in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I've, I've told people that, I've, I've told this to, a lot of times to young people, uh, you know, most, a lot of times as a married person, you can remember that first big fight you had uh, after you get married. You know, the honeymoon's over. Well, I remember ours. We had our anniversary yesterday, 11 years. And I, I still remember very vividly our first fight. It wasn't that long after we got married. Uh, the honeymoon didn't last very long as far as that. But our first big fight was over a movie. And it was some movie I had that, uh, it was a good movie, but it had language. Oh, it was awful. And we got into it, and I, you know, I made the statement of something, something to the effect of, well, it doesn't really bother me. I can overlook that. And uh, you know, her response to me was, maybe it should bother you. Well, that stung a little bit because I knew she was right. And so that was, that was kind of how we got into a fight because I knew I was wrong and I didn't really have a leg to stand on. But uh, we, we really got into it over that. But when that argument was finally over and I finally came to my senses, we threw that movie away. And I got to think about it as I stormed off into the other room to be mad about it for a while. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, this is, this is stupid. In fact, I think she actually said to me, she came out and said, who cares if you never watch that movie again if it keeps your mind and your heart pure and helps you go to heaven? And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, this really is dumb to sit here and say, I like that movie. I want to watch that movie. 
regardless of the spiritual consequences. Yet, don't we so often do that? I mean, so many times, I got to have my television. I got to have my internet. I got to have all these different things. And many times, they're stumbling blocks. And they're hindering our getting to heaven. Well, if you do without television, if you do without cell phones, if you do without internet, you can still go to heaven. But if those things are hindering your path, you're getting to heaven, you're, you're far better off to get rid of them. But Jesus is not talking about a literal chopping off of your hand, chopping off your, uh, or plucking out your eyes. You know, obviously, that is figurative language. Uh, another good example is Luke 14, 26. You know, if you, do, if you come to me and you don't hate your father and mother and brothers and sisters and husband and wife and yea, in your own life also, you can't be my disciple. Well, people have taken that to extremes. In fact, that's another one that the skeptics annotated Bible will jump on and say, oh, look here, you know, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to hate your family. That's not what he's saying there. And readers of the King James in years gone by, this is one of those words that really needs updating in the King James. It's just the idea of love less. He doesn't say that becoming a Christian means that you call up your mom and dad and say, I just want y'all to know I can't stand y'all anymore. I've become a Christian. I'm living the best life possible. Oh, and P.S., I hate you. That's ridiculous. We understand that doesn't even make good common sense. And by the way, that's, I'll just go ahead and tell you, that's the last way you can know figurative language is sometimes it's just common sense. Well, any fool can read Luke 14, 26 and know from other contexts of the teaching of Jesus that's not what he's saying in the literal sense of despising them. It just means he comes first. Well, what if your mom brings you up teaching you something that is wrong? And you learn later in life that here's the right way, the right teaching. Do you just say, uh-uh, my mama taught me that. It was good enough for mama, it's good enough for me. Well, you know, some people do that. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. If you're going to be my disciple, I've got to come before everybody. Why? Well, because as great as mama is, and we all, I'm sure, have great mamas, she's human. Daddy's human. They can be mistaken. But Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God. And he's not going to lead us astray. And so he says, you've got to put me first. Sir. Sir. Right. Can you tell me that the people that know Greek and Greek research that word hate makes you look at it as a word? Can we can we use it and not ask people to stumble and in the interpretation? I think it's probably one of those where in, in their time it would have been understood that way. Right. Um but now, it's just one of those. And there are words in the King James that need updating, honestly. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. Uh, I'm looking at it. I'm, I'm no Greek person, but I do happen to have one on here, uh, just this little Bible program where it's got the Greek, but I don't recognize anything. Uh, I see father, mother, sister. So I, I'm not sure. But, you know, again, using common sense, um, you, can, you can figure that out. But, uh, you know, like I said, there are words in the King James that def prevent is one of them. Prevent today, if, if I prevent you, then, it, you know, it's as if I'm standing somewhere and I'm keeping you from doing something. Well, in the King James, if I prevent you, it just means I went before you. Uh, you know, if I let you in today's English, then I'm allowing you. But if I let
Okay. All right, me and Adam have worked it out, so he's, he's agreed to let me talk again. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll try to take a look at that and see if I can figure it out. I, I, I glanced at it there, but I didn't recognize anything right off. I, I, can, I can pick out a few words here and there, but I didn't see, I just didn't see anything that would indicate, you know, agape is love, but I didn't, and agape, I'm not sure the, how to say to love, but it'll be some kind of a form of agape. But I don't see it. I see coming, uh, coming to me. It may be me say there. That, that's, but I'll, I'll try to take a look at that this week and see. I suspect that's what it is, especially if the ASV has it as well. Because the, the ASV is, that's one drawback of the ASV, it, the 1901 ASV, is that it is so literal that sometimes it's just choppy uh, to read it because it, they, they were so literal in the translation, which sometimes is a good thing. Um, sometimes it makes it hard to read, though. But anyway, when the literal meaning demands something that is wrong or, or would forbid us from doing something that is right, then, you know, obviously you've got a, a figurative language there. And that's a, that's, that gets the idea for our language. I was going to look. I don't, I don't, I, this little Bible program on here, I don't have very many versions. Anybody got like New King James? I don't remember what it says. It does. Hmm. That's odd that the New King James kept that word. And probably they're thinking like what I'm thinking. If, if you read even a smidgen of scripture more than that, you figure out that that's got to be figurative just because, um, if, if you take that to be some kind of uh, literal meaning, then you almost have to have an agenda there because of all the other teaching of, of Jesus on that. Most understand this, this principle that we're talking about here, but, but there are just a few that seek to use uh, everything in a literal way to, and, and doing that to abuse the scriptures. All right, number four, when it is said to be figurative. Well, sometimes it's said to be. The author knows. He's inspired of God. He knows what's figurative and what's not. So when he says something's figurative, guess what? It is. John 2, 18 to 22. Somebody read that for us, please. Now, Jesus, uh, oh yeah, please, I'm sorry, I didn't let you finish. All right, Jesus, Jesus and Joseph, his, I guess we might call him stepfather, uh, his earthly father, um, they were carpenters by trade. But hey, I mean, I'm sure they were good carpenters. But the temple in three days? But the writer, John, the apostle, tells us this is not literal language. He's not talking about the physical temple. He's talking about his body, his resurrection. And John even says when he rose from the dead, they remembered this. So when the writer tells you something represents something else, that it's figurative, well, then it is. Uh, you know, there are times when people will go to, a, I've seen it, and looking at stuff, a lot of times it's on the internet, you know, you find the craziest stuff on the internet sometimes. Um, but I've seen times where, I don't know if it was this passage exactly, but where something, where the writer says something's figurative, and then the guy's sitting here speculating about what it might mean. Uh, I'll tell you an example. The Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. You watch some of the crazy stuff that commentators will do with that passage. And yet, God tells us right there in the passage what it means. And yet, people will sit there and try to figure out, well, I think it means this. How about we just go with God's meaning? I mean, isn't that what we want to do if we're trying to serve God? 
He's in charge, right? He's the one with authority. We talked about that in Sunday, Sunday morning series. Galatians 4.24, Paul says, which things are an allegory? Talking about Hagar and Sarah there? <clears throat> well, what, what, is that, what is that whole history of events with Hagar and Sarah mean? I wonder. Well, Paul says, stop wondering about it. It's an allegory about the old and the new covenant. John 7, 37 to 39, this he spake of the Spirit which has not been received yet, so he tells us it's figurative, I've got to move on. Therefore, we've got to heed the words of the writer in describing what's being said. Another way to know figurative language is when there's mockery going on. Very rarely do people get literal when they're speaking in a mocking kind of a way. Um, <clears throat> 1 Kings 18, 28, Elijah talking to the prophets of Baal. Hey, um, maybe he's asleep. Yell a little louder. Maybe he's on vacation. Well, he doesn't literally mean that Baal could be asleep or on vacation. He knows Baal's nothing anyways. But he's mocking them. He's trying to point out to them, your God is no God at all. He's not real. <clears throat> Acts 2.13. Hey, man, these, these fellows are full of new wine. Well, sometimes people look at that, and it's the word glucose or glucose or something like that in the Greek. And they say, well, that's sugar water. Why, how would they be drunk on sugar water? Boy, I don't understand. Well, we're thinking too literal. They're mocking. I, I told you before, I've, uh, Cliff Goodwin used to say this to me all the time, and I'd get tickled at him. I'd come in talking about something, and if it's something pretty outlandish or something crazy happened to me, and I'd come in. Cliff worked with the youth there at Oxford for a summer. And uh, I'd come in telling him about some crazy event that happened, and he'd say, man, you're high on life. He'd say that all the time. Uh, <laughs> But that's kind of the idea here. You know, these people, they're full of sugar water. They're, they're drunk on some sugar water. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we would joke, joke about that when we were young. We'd say, man, you've had too many Cokes. You know, we, obviously nobody's getting drunk on Coke, but it's the idea of mocking, using figurative language. Acts 23, 1 to 5. God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, Paul says there to the fellow that had him smitten. Well, he didn't, he didn't really call him a wall. He's using figurative language. Matthew 27, 8 and 9, they, they put a scarlet robe on Jesus. Boy, they really thought he was royalty, didn't they, to put that scarlet robe on? No, they didn't. They were mocking. And then they bow the knee. They really had reverence for Jesus, didn't they? No, they're mocking him. They bow the knee and they say, Hail, King of the Jews. Well, they didn't mean that. So be careful with sarcastic words. And then common sense is the last one. We can also use things we already know to be literally true to determine the figurative nature of a particular statement. We already looked at 1 Corinthians 15, 9, least of the apostles. He may have felt this way, but it wasn't literally true. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 12. Matthew 20, 22, and 23, Jesus says to James and John, hey, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink of? Well, sure. Well, you know, we may say, what, where's, that, where's that cup? I wonder what drink they were talking about. It wasn't a literal drink. It was a figurative meaning, the cup of suffering. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And they said, sure. Well, he was talking about the baptism of suffering. Jesus was going to be immersed in suffering. Keep our eyes open, our common sense alert as we study the Bible. John 3, 3 through 5. That's a good example. Jesus says you must be born again, born of water and of the Spirit. Hey, go online and read some people's explanations of that. Being born of water and of the Spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's use some common sense, what Jesus is talking about there. The Spirit is obviously the Holy Spirit, water. You know, some of you say, what is, what is the water? You know, there's, there's a literal aspect there, and then there's a figurative aspect. But he's, he's talking about being born again. Well, you know, here's uh, Nicodemus, and he says, hey, how can I be born again when I'm old? Can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb? Yeah, I often have wondered if Jesus didn't chuckle a little bit when he said that. And say, man... You know, that might have been a time when Jesus, if, if he'd have used that phrase, would have said, you're high on life. Uh, you know, use some common sense, man. Nobody's going to go into their mother's womb and be born again. It's a figurative rebirth. Uh, and then just very quickly, this is kind of a, an addendum, just some rules for interpreting figurative language. Uh, let the author give his own interpretation. I mentioned Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. John 2, we already looked at that. Matthew 13, the parable of the soils or the parable of the sower. Uh, Jesus gives his own interpretation. Well, how about we go with that when, when Jesus gives us his interpretation? Uh, interpret according to the general and the special scope. General scope is the main purpose of the, of the writer. The special scope is any specific part of the general discussion. So you keep that in mind. Romans 3, 20 to 28, talking about the law. 
This happens a lot in Romans and Galatians where he's writing to people that are tempted to go back to the old law. He's not just talking about law in general. And some people do that with Romans. They say, well, look, Paul says we're not under law. We're under grace. Well, looking at the scope of that book, law of Moses is what he's talking about. Grace is the law of Christ. It's not saying we don't have any law, and that's ridiculous. Um, compare figurative with literal, uh, figurative, literal accounts or statements of the same things. Uh, so you can use comparison. You can also look at the resemblance of the things compared. Jesus as a lamb. Uh, ver- John 10, 26, Revelation 5, 5, he's a lion. Well, which is it? What's figurative language? Let me just pull these up here. You can use history and biography to assist. Jeremiah 1, 13 and 14, a seething pot from the north. Well, it's figurative language about Babylon. They came from the north. Uh, any inspired interpretation or use of the figure in an argument or teaching will decide its use. You know, these things happen for an example, 1 Corinthians 10. And be careful not to demand too many points of analogy. Figures are not always used with the same meaning. Leaven. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 6. But then in Matthew 13, 33, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that spread. So not always used the same way. And sometimes parables can explain parables. And we've talked before about Luke 15, those three parables. All right, I got through it. So Lord willing, next week we'll look at figures of thought. And we'll close out with, uh, with that lesson. Thank you all very much for your attention, and we'll take a break before worship.